All right, guys, so today we're looking at electric fields. Um, so basically the idea of fields was introduced so that we can understand why um, objects can exert force on each other even when they're not touching. So like, for example, what we've been looking at with electrostatics, where two objects can repel each other even though they're not in contact. Um, because up until now, we've always defined forces as a push or a pull like that would be directly applied right and now we're looking at um, basically action at a distance so fields are spheres of influence that cause this action at a distance um, you would have looked a little bit at this in physics 20 of course with gravitational fields um, fields that have specific directions like we see with gravity and also we'll see that we see that with electric fields as well are called vector fields right because they have a direction um so if we think about with a gravitational field you know that especially from physics 20 we know that gravity is causing things to accelerate in towards the center of the earth right and so um that means that the field lines are also directed in towards the center of the earth and so, um, yeah, that just explains why everything falls towards Earth due to that gravitational field lines. Um, so the same as masses could create gravitational fields, charges will create their own electric fields. And there's a few main kind of points that you need to be aware of with how we represent electric fields um, and how they generally behave. So electric fields are always going to radiate outward or away from positive charges and toward or into negative charges. So the direction of the arrows you see around the charge that are representing the field lines show the direction of the field. Okay. The other thing is that um, the more field lines you see around an object, the stronger the field is. So here you can see with a charge of plus one, we have, you know, however many lines. And then with a charge of plus two, we double that. Um, Another way to think about the direction of electric fields that can kind of simplify it instead of just trying to remember a positive is out and negative is, is in, is to remember that electric field lines are always going to point in the direction that a small positive charge would move in relation to the charged object. So we know that if we put a small positive charge next to another positive charge, it's going to want to move away. And so we see that the electric field lines are also pointing away. Um, if we put a small positive charge next to a negatively charged object, we know they're going to want to attract, and so we see the lines moving into the negatively charged object. Um, now, if we have, right now we've just looked at the charged lines or the field lines around just a single object, but what's going to happen in reality most of the time is that there's going to be multiple charges interacting, and so we need to be able to understand how the field lines will behave due to attraction or repulsion between charges. So here in these first two examples you can see um, when you have like charges you can see how basically due to repulsion the field lines are going to um, kind of increasingly become pushed apart by each other. So for example here if you think about how our positive charge would have naturally gone if there was no other force around it you can see that on this side of the positive charge it kind of follows that idea but the field lines start to be pushed away by this other positive charge. Okay, so we see that repulsion. The other important thing to notice is that there's a gap in between like charges. And so in this space, there is actually no electric field because of the repulsion. Same thing is true for these mm. negatively char negative charges. It's just that the field lines are directed differently. They're directed inwards, right? Um, now, when we have two opposite charges because of the way that they're going to interact. We know that the electric field lines will leave the positive object and go into the negative. And so we actually see that happening directly here where we're going from the positive to the negative. Um, but even as you go further up, all of these lines from the positive are kind of going to eventually loop up and over into this negative. So we see this increasing kind of bubble going from the positive and into the negative. So we're going to always see those field lines. Um, moving in that way. So the strength of the electric field is going to depend on the distance from the charge producing the electric field. And you'll probably remember that this is kind of similar to gravitational fields because if something moves further away, we know that the pull of gravity is not going to be as strong on it, right? 
Same thing here with electric fields. And so basically we have this formula, E is equal to KQ over uh, radius squared. Okay. Now, a couple of important things to be aware of when you're using this formula. Um, technically, I guess we should put this little arrow, vector arrow above the electric field to remember that it is a vector quantity. Um, the other thing to be aware of is when you are entering your values, you should only be using absolute values. So I believe on your formula sheet, it actually shows that. Um, so he, mm, it's kind of weird. I guess it shows it just for the electric field. Um, but I guess what they're saying is like whatever you calculate in here should result in an overall, like in, you should be using the absolute value. And then we only assign positive or negative or directions based on what we know about the behavior of the charges or the field. Okay, And that'll become a little bit more clear when we actually start working with, um, with these formulas. The other thing to be aware of is that you should only use this equation when you're dealing with um, an object that is producing the electric field. Okay. So this component here is important, producing, okay? So if you have a charge that's within a field, you're not going to be using this formula. You're only going to use this if you know the charge on the object that's producing the field. So that's Q, and that's measured in coulombs. And you know the distance um, from the charge producing the electric field, okay, to a point P in the field. So that's your radius. Um, the other thing we have here, electric field, just keep in mind the formula, or the units rather, I guess, are going to be newtons per coulomb. So an electric field is basically telling us how much force exists for every unit of charge. Okay. Um, we also have coulombs constant, which we already looked at last time. Um, so you're going to be using that a little bit more. Okay. Uh, let's see. So from this equation, we can see that the electric field strength and distance have an inverse squared relationship. So maybe pause the video for a second to your, and think to yourself or answer the following questions. What are we going to say E is proportional to if it's proportional to the inverse squared relationship? And based on that proportionality, what will the graph look like? Okay. So if you pause the video, great. And if you figured out that the electric field is going to be proportional to the inverse, like to 1 over radius squared, then you are correct. Okay. And so basically that's the same as saying y is proportional to 1 over x squared because we have electric field on the y-axis and r on the x-axis. And so we're going to see that um, shape of a graph that we looked at, same kind of a shape as we saw with the electric force, right, where you have that... Um, exponent, the inverse exponent there. Um, also, sorry guys, I feel like something's sticking here. Um, now we can relate this, like I mentioned earlier, you can relate this to gravity. So if we think about the formula that we were using there, our gravitational field strength was equal to a gravitational constant times by a mass divided by radius squared. And so we would say that g is proportional to Again, if you want, you can pause the video, although this one's probably kind of a giveaway. <laughs> so if you pause the video, great. Um, and you should have guessed that it's proportional to 1 over r squared, so exactly the same as we see with the electric field. And you're going to end up with the same shape. I'm just not very good at drawing it. Okay. And so, um, again, we see this really close similarity between electrical fields and, and um, gravitational fields which can be really handy when you're trying to do calculations and determine whether or not what you figured out makes sense because gravity is quite intuitive and so you can kind of understand um, how that would work and hopefully you can kind of carry that over into electric fields as well. Um, okay, so electric field strength can be calculated based on the force another charged object will experience when they're placed in the existing field. Okay, and so this is what I was mentioning up here. We were using this formula for something producing the field. When you're dealing with a charge that's placed in a field, this is the formula you're going to use, which is going to be electric field strength. And again, this is going to be absolute values is equal to your electric force, which is also your vector quantity divided by Q. 
Okay, and you'll see again if you look on your um, formula sheet here. No, oh, they're not actually talking about absolute values, but I just recommend that you're consistent and use absolute values throughout and then use your understanding of how the charges would act to determine the, the net direction or positive or negative. Okay. Um, so we're looking at the same kind of units. E electric field is measured in newtons per coulomb. And here you can actually see why we have that measurement, right? It's because we have force divided by charge, um, which is measured in newtons and coulombs. Okay, so force is newtons, and Q is the charge of the object in the electric field. So again, that's an important kind of component to be aware of there. So make sure you know which, um, which formula to use when. So let's look at some examples of how we would do calculations based on this. If the distance from a point charge is tripled, and the charge on the point charge is also tripled, by what factor does the electric field strength change? Okay, and so if we're thinking about um, an object in a field, right, or sorry, we're not looking at in a field, we're looking at a distance from the charge, okay, and then we're looking at modifying the distance as well as the charge on the object producing the field, and so we want to stick with our formula for objects producing field, which is E equals KQ over R squared. Now, they're telling us that our modification we're going to do is we're going to triple the charge and we're also going to triple the radius. And so by now, hopefully you guys are becoming pretty comfortable with questions like this, where you're basically just looking at ratios. Remember that what you're always trying to do with your modified is pull out the original and see how the modified numbers will, will alter that original value, right? So if we wanted to say, um, what would our original value be here? we are going to pull out the 3 and the 3, but make sure that we've adjusted them accordingly based on the formula. So right here we have just a 3 on top. It's not squared, it's not multiplied by anything, so it's going to stay as a 3. However, on the bottom, the triple that we give for the radius is squared, and so it's going to be 3 over 9. And that's going to be multiplied by keeping our original kq divided by r squared. Okay, and so here we can kind of see that our original was this kq over r squared. Our modified is going to be that value multiplied by 3 ninths. And so now, of course, we want to just make sure we simplify this, right? 3 ninths, how would you simplify that into an easier fraction? If you guessed that you have to reduce it to a third, that's great. Um, so now we would say our electric field modified. Sorry, I should have put that in here. Modified, we always represent with that little prime. Um, so our electric field that's been modified is one third of the original electric field. Okay, so the electric field without the prime. And you can say that in a whole bunch of different ways. Like if you were on a test, you could say the modified field is a third of the original. Um, that might be a little bit better, actually. But even if you wrote something like this in, I would be able to understand that. Um, next component here we have is to determine the electric field strength 0.7 meters south of a negative 8.5 microcoulomb charged object. So putting down our variables, we're looking for electric field strength. So we want E. We're given um, a distance, so that's always going to be radius in this case, and it's already in meters, so we don't need to change it. We're also given a charge. With your charges, usually they are given in microcoulombs, so you always want to just change it into coulombs, because um, if you remember, we did mention here, your charge should be in coulombs, as well as down here, your charge should be in coulombs. Okay, so that's our standard unit. Um, the nice thing is that microcoulombs are easy to convert because basically it's always just going to be whatever your value is times by 10 to the power of negative 6 for your coulombs. Okay. Um, so now we have E, R, and Q. So there's a couple of ways you can approach this. Um, if you look on here, you can see that we have electric field here, KQ over R squared. Um, and so you're kind of pushed right away into using the appropriate formula, which is the formula for something that's producing the field. Because if you were looking at something in the field, you would need to have a force, and we don't have that. Okay, so we're going to be using um, the formula E equals KQ over R squared. 
And again, you're going to want to keep in mind to use your absolute values there. So if we plug in our numbers, absolute values mean we're not going to take into account that negative for the 8.5. So you can see even when I wrote down my variables, I left that out. So k is 8.99 times by 10 to the power of 9. And I'm not going to write in all those big long units. Times by 8.50 times by 10 to the power of negative 6 coulombs. And then we're going to divide that out by 0 0.700 meters squared. Okay, and that gives us 155948.9 something newtons per coulomb. Okay. Now, before we give our final vector answer, because our um, electric field should have a direction with it, we want to basically think about which direction the electric field would be pointing. So if we have a negatively charged object, which direction would you expect the field to be pointing in? So if you want, you can pause it a second. Okay, and so keep in mind um, that it's the direction a positive charge would move, which would be towards the negative charge, right? So it's going to kind of look like this. Okay, that was super messy, um, but you get the point, right? And so it's saying determine the electric field towards the south of the object. So if we're down here, which direction is the field going to be pointing? Well, it should be pointing towards the south, or sorry, towards the north, okay? And so for our final answer, we're going to say that the direction is north, and then just round for sig digs. So we need three sig digs. So we're going to say one electric field is equal to 1.56 times by 10 to the power of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 newton coulombs. And then add in that direction. So we said it's going to be pointing north. Okay. All right, last question, I believe. Here. Oh no, there's one more. Um, okay, so there's a positive 5 microcoulomb charged object. It's placed in an electric field of 2.2 times 10 to the 4 newton coulombs to the east. And we want to determine the force. So again, here, you should be able to recognize because we're looking at an object placed in the electric field, you should know which formula to use. But also the variables do direct us towards it, right? We're given Q, we're given the electric field, and we want to determine Fe. So this one is quite straightforward, right? Um, we're going to use this formula and we're just going to rearrange. And so basically um, we have E is equal to Fe over Q. And we want to solve for Fe, so we're going to say Fe is equal to E times by Q. And so now you can just basically plug in your numbers. I might have to do... Um, I'm down. So 5 microcoulombs is 5 times by 10 to the power of negative 6. Oh, whoops, I should enter that one in a second. So I guess 2.20 times by 10 to the 4 newton coulombs times by 5 times by 10 to the negative 6 coulombs, which is going to give me, um, let's see, 0 0.11 newtons. And now again, because we used absolute values, right, we need to um, determine which direction that's going to act. So the electric field is going moving to the east. Okay, so we want to just sketch that out. Um, and we put the object into this field that's moving east, okay, and it's a positively charged um, positively charged object. So if this electric field is moving towards the east, then we know that over here there has to be some kind of a negatively charged object, right? Because that would be the direction the field would be moving in. And so if the field is moving this way, then the force also has to be moving in the same direction. Okay, so Fe is also going to be moving towards the east. So for our final answer, we're going to say Fe is equal to 0 0.11 newtons east. Oops. Okay, there's our final answer. Um, all right.
The next thing we're going to look at here really quickly is looking at vector sums. So if you have two charges involved, the resulting electric field is going to be a vector sum. And the math of this is going to be really similar to finding net force. So keep in mind how we would have done that, right? You would have found the different components of force, um, added them up based on their direction. And then if you have x and y components, remember you need to divide it up into those and find your x total and y total and then find the resultant. But we'll look at that next. Um, so for this one, it's a little bit more straightforward. There's only an x component. And it's asking you, what is the electric field strength midway between charged objects of negative 3.5 microcoulombs and positive 3 microcoulombs that are placed 0.44 meters apart? So with this kind of a question, it's important that you sketch it out first so that you have an idea of the direction the fields are moving in. And so if we think about object one was that negative three and a half, um, and so we know that the field, will, field lines will be directed in towards that negative charge. Um, and then object two is going to be um, positive, and so the electric field lines are going to be directed away from it and towards the negative charge. Okay, It wouldn't have mattered if you put the negative over here and the positive over here. You still would have gotten the same kind of like overall direction or overall number, I guess, magnitude, and it would have just been the, the um, direction that would have changed. So in a question, if you would have had it on a test, I would have specified where one was or where they both were so that you wouldn't be left to guess whether the field was to the left or to the right. Okay. The other option is you could have just said the field is directed towards the negatively charged object if you weren't sure about left or right. All right, so um, the other thing is to think about what's happening here distance-wise. So if these are placed 0 0.440 meters apart, and we're looking for the strength midway, okay? So basically our distance from each charge is going to be 0.22 meters, okay? And so we can use that for our calculations because we're looking for this point in space. And so um, if I have object one over here, I'm just going to say I'm going to calculate its electric field. So we'll call that E1. And that's going to be KQ, whoops, KG, KQ1 divided by radius squared, right? So we're looking for the electric field strength of each of these components, and then we can sum them up to find the net electric field. So we're going to have 8.99 times 10 to the power of 9 times by Q1, which is negative 3.50. Whoops. And now I'm disregarding my own rules, so make sure that you just keep it as um, absolute values. 3.50. This is why usually I leave this out in my list of variables, but because I was trying to draw the electric fields, I put in the negative and the positive. So just be careful when you're actually entering in your calculations. Times by 10 to the power of negative 6 coulombs. And we're dividing it by the radius squared, so keep in mind the radius is just going to be the halfway point. So 0 0.220 meters squared. And that's going to give us um, 6.5010, something like that, times by 10 to the power of 5 newtons per coulomb. Okay, we're going to do the same thing for the second charge, so it's going to be kq2 over r squared, and again 8.99 times by 10 to the power of 9 times by 3 times by 10 to the power of negative 6 coulombs as our charge. And again, using that halfway point, 0 0.220 meters squared, which is going to give us 5.5723, something like that, times by 10 to the power of 5 newton coulombs. Okay, and so now we want to do, just like we would have done with forces, we want to do, an, instead of an F net equation, we're going to do an E net equation. And so basically what that means is, it, it's kind of up to you how you want to set this up, but basically we know that these electric fields are going to be summative because they're both pointing in the same direction. So we can either say they're both negative because I happen to draw this to the left. Let's stick with that so we don't get confused. Um, so we're going to have, oops, I don't need brackets yet. So I'll do negative E1 plus 
negative e2. Okay, and so the math there is just negative 6.50 whatever times by 10 to the power of 5 newtons per coulomb plus negative 5.572 times by 10 to the power of 5 newton coulombs. Okay, and so when we add those together, we should get negative 1.2073 times by 10 to the power of 6 newtons per coulomb. Okay, and so now as our final, we can say um, E net is equal to 1.2, let's see, we need three sig digs, so 1.21 times by 10 to the power of 6 newtons per coulomb. And because we ended up with an overall negative value here, we're going to say to the left, just like we had sketched out in our drawing. Okay. Alternatively, we could say towards the negative charge. Um, okay, so this last one I've pretty much filled in because it is very similar to what we looked at with Coulomb's, um, Coulomb's law. It's also the same as what we would have looked at with gravitational fields. Um, like determining net gravitational fields. The only difference between this one and the previous one that we just did is that there's going to be an x and a y component. And so here in this diagram, it says from the diagram, determine the electric field at point P and then determine the electrostatic force on a negative 3 uh, nanocoulomb charge if it were placed at point P. Okay, and so basically all I would look for here is um, I'm going to set up everything the same way. So I have a negative charge here, so I know that my field will be directed in that direction. And here I have a positive charge, so I know that my field will be directed away from the positive charge. Okay, so now I have my directions, and you're just going to follow the exact same set of steps, right? So E1, um, which is, I'm just going to arbitrarily say this is 1. And this is two. Oh, you know what? I already set it up properly so that I wouldn't even have to label that. I did it E negative two, so that's my charge, and E plus four. Okay, so I have it set up like that already. So now I would just say, you know, do my math for kq over r squared. I'm going to get a number value, and then I need to assign it a direction. So we already looked at this and said because this is negative, um, you can either say left or let's say in this case west, just to keep things easy because it's x and y components. Um, whereas with our plus 4, same thing, same calculation, but we're, the number we get is going to be an electric field that is directed towards the north in this case. Okay, so it's just important that you pay attention to your directions so that you can set up your calculations for doing the resultant electric field. And so we know that we're going to have the north component going here, and then our west component going here. So just making sure you're drawing tip to tail. Um, of course, you could have also gone west and then north. It doesn't really matter. You would have just had a different direction written in at the end there. But just make sure you're sticking with tip to tail. So now if I have, this is my north one, so this 6.392 times 10 to the power of 6. My west one is that 1.798 times 10 to the power of 6. I square each of them, add them together, square root them, just using Pythagoras use your trig to figure out the direction and so now I have my overall answer here 6.64 and I'm going to round it appropriately to set up my directions right um, the second component of this I actually kind of forgot I wanted to just have this done for you guys but I guess I didn't quite do it determine the electrostatic force on a negative 3 nanocoulomb charge if it is placed at point P so now we have our um, electric field at that point, 6.64 times 10 to the power of 6, you don't need to worry about the um, direction for calculations. You can just say that that's our net um, electric field. And then make sure that you know how to do your conversion for a nanocoulomb. So, so far we've been doing microcoulombs, so we would have done times 10 to the power of negative 6. When you're looking at a nano, it's times 10 to the power of 9. So we are going to say that our Q is equal to 3.00 times by 10 to the power of negative 9 coulombs. Okay, And we already have our electric field. So now we're just going to use 
this formula here to solve for the force. So it's going to be electric field times by Q. So Fe is equal to 6.64 times by 10 to the power of 6 newtons per coulomb times by um, 3.00 times by 10 to the negative 9 coulombs. And I don't have the exact number here in my calculator, so I don't want to mess you guys up um, in terms of um, giving you like an inappropriate number, and I don't want to make you wait for me to <laughs> punch in all the calculations again. So you're going to get a number here. The main thing you just have to pay attention to is at that point, um, let's see. So if we have this placed at point um, P, you do need to think about the direction. So because our charge that we've introduced to the field, oops, sorry guys, I was way off the page there. Um, so point P, so you have to think about the fact that you're introducing a negatively charged object here. And so we know that it is going to be um, moving against the field lines. Okay, so this is kind of the tricky component. We talked about how you would have, um, you can always think of field lines as the direction that a positively charged object would move. So that means that if you have a negatively charged object, it needs to be moving in the opposite direction. And so basically you're going to have to find the opposite direction of 15.7 degrees west of north, right? So instead it's going to be going um, whatever number of value this is. And then... I would personally need to kind of just sketch this out because I would do, sorry guys, just fruit flies flying into my mouth, 15.7 um, degrees towards the west of north. So then yeah, it's going to have to be going the opposite of that, so be going 15.7 degrees, should be on this side, towards the east of south. Okay, um, I'll, f I'll finish filling this in and scan it in for the filled in notes so you guys will have the full calculations available to you. So if I do change it because I'm just eyeballing it right now, um, just maybe take a look at that and see what the change would be. But just the main point there is to be aware of the fact that you would have the opposite direction for a negatively charged um, object as the field lines are going in. Okay, um, so you guys have some practice problems to do out of the textbook. You also have um, practice, time, practice problems given here. The only other thing you kind of need to be aware of here is um, how electric field lines are going to, um, I don't know what the word would be, like how electric field lines are going to be drawn for different types of objects. And it is important that you guys know this. It does show up pretty regularly in tests and questions. Um, so really quickly, I'll just go through the basics. You can probably figure these out on your own. There is also information on, in the textbook about this, so you can always read through that um, if you want additional information. But basically, all you need to know for this is that electrons are always moving until they can reach static equilibrium. So basically, where they're at rest and there's no net force on them. So they're trying to minimize the repulsive forces between them. Right, so they're always trying to move as far apart as they can do to repulsion. So let's look at a few examples. These are the main types of shapes that you need to know for this. Um, for a solid sphere, and if you want you can pause and try and think about which way these electric field lines would be going um, and then and then come back to the video. Okay, all right, so if you paused it if you have a solid sphere, you always want to think about the conductor in terms of electrons. So if we have negatively charged electrons at the surface of this sphere, they're going to be trying to stay as far away from each other as possible. And so we're going to see electric field lines. Oh, whoops, I'm going the wrong way, you guys, because we're thinking about negatively charged electrons. And so then we know that our fields are going to be directed in. So basically the main thing with a sphere, a solid sphere, is that you're going to see an equal distribution of field lines kind of coming in towards here. And I know I'm not doing like a super good job of that, but it should be equally distributed field lines kind of going all the way around. Okay. Now with a solid plate, 
Um, we have the electrons are kind of lined up along the surface, trying to keep each other as far apart as possible. And so again, we're going to see kind of the same thing as we see with this um, solid sphere, where we're just going to have pretty uniform field lines directed in towards the plate. Okay. Things start to get a little bit weird with these last two. So within a regular solid, basically what happens is for the flat portion here, we can imagine that these field lines are going to be kind of the same. But what happens when the object starts curving in this direction? Well, basically what happens is, as the electrons are exerting force to repel each other, now they're starting to have repulsive forces that are in the Y component as well as the X component. And so the repulsive forces, because they're now distributed through X and Y, there's going to be less repulsive force in the X direction. And so that means that actually they're going to be clustered in a little bit closer together. So if we had further apart lines here, as we move closer towards like a convex area of a regularly shaped object, we're going to see that the lines start to become more dense. Okay? And so you might just want to write that in, more dense near convex. areas. And so convex just means um, bent yeah, outwards. Areas. Okay. Last of all, we have hollow object. Okay. So if we have a sphere like this, on the outside, we're going to see kind of a similar idea to the solid sphere, right? We have these negatively charged um, electrons, and we're going to see um, that the electric field lines are directed in towards them and we still have that kind of like even distribution okay but the big change that's going to happen is there's because there's equal and opposite forces and these objects are or these charges are remaining in static equilibrium it means that there must be a force in here that's balancing out and so what we actually see is that um, that balanced force means that there's no electric charge inside or sorry no electric field inside of the hollow object sorry guys this is getting pretty messy <laughs> okay so the main thing to know for a hollow sphere is no um, electric field inside okay um again read through the part in the book if you want like a better understanding of that it will probably help you out um and that is everything for this time so next time we're going to look at parallel plates um and so that was actually the last shape that you needed to know and i mentioned that we'll discuss those later on in the notes so you need to know all of these types of how the electric fields would be around these objects as well as parallel plates and we will look at that next time